Hey, everyone, how's it going? And welcome back to Citywide Bites. You know, folks, after hearing this interview, I hope you'll be a little bit more, more careful when you when you open that um, that random email because you just never know what's going to happen. This is the subject of my next guest, soon to be released book. Justin joins us to talk about the reluctant reckoner out on October eighth. Justin, welcome back to the show, man. It's great to have you here. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Oh, well, thank you. Hey, honors all mine, man. Uh, so goodbye. let's start. Let's start with just uh, take us on a quick walk through what this book is all about. Give us the elevator pitch, as, as they say. Sure. So it really tells the story of what I would call an everyday guy who's thrust into this crazy situation. He's an accountant. He's by the book, you know, by the straight and narrow. And all of a sudden he gets implicated in a fraud scheme. And it turns out that he's cleared of that, but now um, he has met some people who want some things from him and they've demonstrated their leverage and he spends the book basically trying to keep his family safe with both these unknown conspirators who are needing things from him and also the United States FBI that wants his help bringing them down. And it feels like throughout the entire story, no matter what he does, it's not a happy ending for him. Doesn't sound like it. No, no. This sounds like, <laughs> like I said, a very like average guy, just you know, keeping his like nose clean. All of a sudden, boom, this happens. So let us talk about our protagonist, Mark Writers. Uh, I like I actually like the last names. I feel like it, it, it kind of sums him up. He's just a right guy. He's just doing things for the right, you know, following the rules. How does Mark handle this situation? Uh, so when I thought about the character, I tried to picture you know, what I think the majority of us out there, myself included, might do, you know, you're not special traces, special forces trained, and you don't have experience with the military. You know, you're, you're not necessarily a counter surveillance expert, what would you do? The first thing that he does is he reaches out to the closest friend he has that he knows has dabbled with this sort of stuff before. And he basically says, hey, look, this is what happened. I don't know who these guys are can you help? And um, things take a very interesting turn from there. Uh, his friend does get a little bit of investigation done, but ultimately what ends up happening after that is he's approached by our own Federal Bureau of Investigation because they now want him, they want Mark to help them bring down these antagonists. But the problem that Mark has is he doesn't have training or experience in dealing with these people. He's got two very opposing sides with two completely different objectives that both feel he's a linchpin. And if either one of them gets upset, he could end up losing his life. He could end up going to jail and he has an eight year old daughter to think about as well. So uh, I try to write Mark as though you know, he's sort of a, he's in a state of panic, but he has to force himself to calm down to make each decision after the, before the next one and really put his daughter ahead of everything else in terms of, you know, what his desired outcome is. And the, the thing that really dawned on me as I was doing the research for this book, because this book involves a lot of, uh, identity theft type fraudulent financial, uh, criminal activity. The reason why Mark was contacted in the first place is because he is a straight and narrow guy with the technical expertise. It's actually the perfect target for someone wanting to do bad things. Get me the technical expertise. Get me the guy that can tell me what I need to know in these systems, but then has absolutely no training to be able to fight back and everything to lose and nothing to win by working with me. It's like, it's the perfect target. And it kind of makes you shiver a little bit because you realize, boy, this could be me. Exactly, easily. I mean, I mean, this kind of stuff is in the news all the time. You hear about all these new scams coming out. AI is now becoming used to fake like law enforcement voices, uh, for example. So it's definitely a scary world uh, these days. I'm curious if anything in particular inspired this book is something you saw in the news or something that kind of happened to someone you know. 
Uh, well, ironically enough, at the time that I had written it, you know, the very first draft, no. I had written the first draft, you know, based on a collection of inputs that I've read from newspapers and, you know, kind of gone through, you know, stories and let the imagination run wild. But I couldn't say that there was any one person I knew that had gone through a similar experience. However, after the first draft was written, uh, I myself became the victim of identity theft. Now, it was, oh, nothing, damn. it was nothing like what happened to Mark. I hope not. What happened geez. to Mark is a whole new level. But I will tell you that when, when you become the victim of identity theft, your eyes get open to, you know, a whole different world. The I filed a police report and the detective told me that this is an up and coming trend that gangs from the west and south side of Chicago have started infiltrating identity theft, which I didn't even know. I, I had no concept that that was happening. And I will say that when, when that happens to a person and you're forced to lock all of your credit and freeze everything and everything else, you, you realize just how vulnerable we all really are. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the way I found out was I opened up a piece of mail and it was for a credit card statement for a credit card that I had never taken out. And come to find out that there are some very intelligent people that are looking for ways to try to exploit your data and your finances. And we all kind of know that generically as we hear about all these prices, all these data breaches, you know, where they give you a year of free credit monitoring, like that's gonna make up the difference. But, um, but when it actually happens to you and you actually see your name on a car loan application or whatever, 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 it's uh it's startling mm -hmm. it's it's very scary yeah i mean like or 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 you hear from your bank and they tell you yeah your account's been cleaned out because someone hacked into their servers or what have you so it's yeah it, it's definitely it's definitely something that we hear about and we think thank god that this doesn't happen to me so i'm sorry it happened to you <laughs> no i appreciate that max you know i like i said it's um you know, there are worse problems in the world, uh, mm -hmm. but, it is, but it is a big headache. And I must say that in my case, short of uh, a bunch of time being wasted, I didn't lose any money. I didn't lose any, you know, anything other than some valuable time. But mm -hmm. uh, like in Mark's case, I, I honestly, I actually had just written sort of a little piece about this book. And uh, what I, what I believe readers will be saying to themselves as they read this book is gosh i'm glad i'm not mark <laughs> uh, for a lot of reasons poor mark he finally gets through the ringer huh oh yeah my my story is like a walk in the park compared to what happens to him because you know as it turns out um the you know the implied fraud that starts at the beginning of the book that's just their way of saying, okay, now you know who we are. Now you know what we're capable of. Here's what we mm -hmm. need you to do. And that's a terrifying thing to think about. But again, the more I kind of put this together and thought about this guy and thought about this scheme, the more realistic it seemed. He would be the perfect target for someone wanting to do bad things, like a lot of mm -hmm. us would be. Okay. Now, this is your fourth book to date. And your previous books were also different kinds of thrillers. But uh, for The uh, Reluctant Reckoner, did you get to go in any, um, any uh, new directions as a writer? Yeah, absolutely. So I, my, the evolution of my writing has really, uh, it's, it's enhanced, I believe, and I've gotten some confirmation of, of readers who have told me this. I really tried to dig deep into the character development side of things with the this latest book. Uh, the first story, great story. I mean, I think they're all good books. I've gotten compliments on them, but uh, it was, you know, 98% plot, 2% character. And I would say that, that this one is, you know, the same level of plotting, but I really tried to hone into these characters and make them relatable to people and went places in my writing that, quite frankly, 
uh, we're in a part of my traditional comfort zone. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a first draft, love the plot, get the ideas out there and everything. And it was actually my wife and some, some readers in a reader group that have really encouraged me to really focus on filling out these characters and make people really identify with them and like them, which did not come as naturally to me as perhaps it does to others. So that's been a huge shift from say book one to book four. Do you feel like this puts you in a better spot to write book five? Cause I can't imagine you're done. Uh, book five's draft is complete and uh, it absolutely helped me uh, because writing is a gradual process, right? It's kind of like I was telling I was telling my daughter the other day, you know, math is a gradual process, right? You have to learn your times tables before you can try to do long division and you have to know this before that. And it's not like you're learning these things in chunks and not using them when you go to the next chunk. The, the benefit that I had of, of really taking that character development focus um, in this book most certainly translated to helping with the next one because uh, it's a skill set that you can continue to build up. And part of the part of the fun for me is these books are meant to be fast paced, right? I mean, they're not they're not books that you want to stall or or take too long in prose. So figuring out ways to give more backstory and more insight to who these people are via showing while there's action happening is a lot of fun, but it's very hard. And I feel like, this fourth book, uh, The Reluctant Reckoner, really does uh, implement that. And that certainly helped as I worked through uh, the next one. Great All right, question. let's, Great question. Well, thank you, thank you. Let's talk about book covers, because of course, as they say, I know it's funny because the old thing is don't judge a book by its cover, but you totally do that anyway. Yeah. Your cover is pretty cool. It depicts this you know, guy in a suit with a briefcase standing for this massive maze. Yeah. Where did the idea come from? Because I think it's yes. really kind of spot on for a poor Mark. So I actually have a, a copy here. Yes, that let's I see. Sort of like show. So yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, it's the, so the cool. Idea, yeah, thank you very much. The idea is that you know this is obviously Mark, and he's he's intentionally not sprinting because he's more of a straight narrow guy. Like he's he's trying to walk his way through this crazy maze, and he doesn't know where he's going but he does know that he can't take the wrong turns and the interesting thing about this we can get a, i'm getting a little closer these mazes have numbers on them that oh, correspond that to some of the account information and some of the uh, numerical things that he has to do so he's sort of walking through this labyrinth this is the city of chicago in the background and the idea is to try to capture how confused and helpless he feels. Because when you look at this cover, there is no way out. There are a whole bunch of dead ends and they're all covered with numbers. And that's really how he feels throughout this story. Um, he actually laments the fact that he's not, you know, some former Navy SEAL or some former Marine because he feels unequipped to be in the situation that he's in. And yet, his daughter's life depends on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, Justin, you got the book in your hands. Let's do a read. We want to give people a taste as to what is in store in this book. Oh, sure. I would love to. I thought, uh, you know, this, I'll, since we've talked about the, um, the email in the beginning and the, mm -hmm. the catch there, I thought maybe I'll read just, this is from the very beginning of the book. This is chapter one. I'm going to put on some spectacles here for some old man eyes, and I'll just read this aloud for just a page. <clears throat> it was 4.07 on a sunny Friday afternoon in Chicago when the email appeared in his inbox. The cloudless May blue skies and 75 degree temperature begged for an early escape, but Mark knew it wouldn't happen. Mark, don't be alarmed. The discrepancy will be cleared up soon. Tom. He ignored the flashing Outlook meeting reminder, telling him it was time for his daily organization and stared harder at the memo. The OCD that compelled him to align all his desktop items at right angles to the furniture surface would have to wait. The front field was empty and the subject line was blank. 
None of the 26 employees at Lafferty and Sons accounting firm was named Tom. And despite the somewhat common name, he couldn't think of anyone he personally knew with it either. He leaned back in his chair and sipped lukewarm coffee from the same white porcelain cup he used every day, repeatedly clicking his blue ink pen, the only type he'd used since college. A quick reply email was promptly returned as an undeliverable message and right clicking on the memo led to a dead end of unhighlighted menu options. He glanced at the only personal item on his nearly empty desk, a picture of Catherine in her mother's arms, three weeks after she was born, two years before Marianne died. His deceased wife's beautiful blue eyes stared right back. The picture was eight years old, <clears throat> and yet those eyes always made him smile and tear up at the same time. His constant reminder of how bittersweet life can be. Focus, Mark. Get back to the email. Maybe it was a prank. While this example would be a bit extreme, it'd be just like his coworker Bruce, two offices down to toy with him right before the weekend. Bruce was always testing the limits of his excessive planning and scheduling, trying to inject variety and surprise at Mark's expense wherever possible. He hated it, which only encouraged Bruce. The problem was Bruce took off early to beat the traffic. And it seemed like such a stretch that Bruce would do this. Just then the phone began to ring. Mark, Larry needs to see you. Okay, give me a minute to right now, Mark. He told me that you have to drop everything you're doing and get to his office immediately. His boss's secretary didn't even try to hide her uneasiness. I'll be right there, Gene. Very odd, he thought. Gene seldom sounded tense and Larry was never in a hurry. So that's chapter one. That's about oh a boy. And a half. So Mark Mark is not going to have a good day at work today. No, <laughs> no, it's um, not a good day for Mark uh, that Friday. No. All right. Well, Justin, uh, we are coming down to the end of this conversation, but uh, a couple more questions before we go. Now, as I mentioned before, you have uh, four books out, and you also are now a multi award winning writer. So you get to put that on your resume. Um, your book, uh, the the, uh, the Deadly Deal, was named the 2023 Medical Thriller of the Year by BestThrillers.com. Your book, The Hubley Case, was a New York City um, uh, Best Book Award winner. So you obviously made some waves since you started in this. But do you feel like you've like arrived as a writer? Are you like officially a writer now? Well, thank you for the very nice question. Um, those those awards certainly meant a lot, particularly the the thriller of the year award. You know, you never you never really know how a book is going to be received. You can have a very educated guess. You can feel good about it, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's subjective, and it should be. That's that's what's great about writing and music and art is, you know. One guy likes it, another guy doesn't. It, you know, it's what makes the world go round. So I was uh, truly flattered to receive those awards. Uh, certainly validated some of the very early mornings and very late nights of, of writing. Uh, but to answer your question, um, no, I, I believe I'm coming into my own with it. I, I've enjoyed writing more as I've continued to do it. I would like to continue to do it on an ongoing basis and... Uh, it's, it's always been a passion of mine that I believe is, is the best is yet to come, but, uh, it is certainly humbling and it makes me very thankful that, uh, that these books have been given these awards. So I really appreciate the question. Max. Okay. All right. So the big question though, the big thing to wrap this up is what is next for you? Uh, another great one. Uh, so I have I have two stories that I've been dabbling with. One is a little bit further along than the other. Um, and as these are subject to change, um, I'm not going to get into too, too many details. But I will say that uh, one of them is a small town mystery set uh, crime um, that, that will maybe bring people back to a different era and it's a slight twist on some of the books that I've written to date. And the other one that I'm toying with brings back some characters that some readers have been asking about from the first couple books. So uh, certainly working on them both and writing and talking with the, 
the publisher about them. And I would say that in the next couple of months, there might be some fun updates. But I really appreciate I look, I look forward to that. And folks, if you want to learn all the information, get the books, watch the trailers, because he actually has trailers for his books. Uh, uh, you go to jleethrillers.com. Everything is there. Of course, follow his socials, leave reviews, good, bad, just leave them. We like reviews. Leave them all there. And uh, Justin, uh, certainly uh, uh, looking forward to checking out the 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 uh, Reluctant Reckoner. October October 8th is a big drop date. And uh, also looking forward to our next uh, conversation. Max, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on your excellent show. And if there's ever anything I can do for you, you just let me know. Really so had a great time. Oh, thank you. And for all the other folks at home, thank you guys once again for tuning in. Follow our socials. Follow the show. If you want to be a guest, you can get me at citywidemax.yahoo.com. We will see you all next time. Thanks, everyone.